In 1831, Darwin, then 22 years old, set sail on a five-year survey expedition for the British Empire. He journeyed from England on the HMS Beagle, traveling around the southern tip of South America, then north toward a chain of volcanic islands in the Pacific called the Galapagos. On this desolate archipelago, 600 miles off the western coast of Ecuador, Charles Darwin encountered an extraordinary array of birds, reptiles, and mammals, the likes of which he had never seen before. For more than a month, Darwin studied plant and animal life, took extensive notes, and collected specimens. Then he left, never to return. 25 years passed as he developed a theory about how the diverse forms of life on Earth had originated. In 1859, Darwin published a book titled On the Origin of Species. Its impact on science and ultimately all of Western culture was dramatic. Darwin argued that all life was the product of purely undirected natural forces. Time, chance, and a process he called natural selection. For 2,500 years before Darwin, most prominent scientists and philosophers, people such as Plato or Newton or Kepler, viewed the world as the product of some kind of design or plan. But a fundamental shift occurs with Darwin's idea of natural selection, and a real change in scientific philosophy is set in motion. Darwin was not the first scientist to propose a theory of evolution, but he was the first to offer a plausible naturalistic mechanism that could produce biological change over long periods of time. To understand how natural selection works, consider the finch populations Darwin encountered on the Galapagos Islands. Thirteen species of finches inhabit the Galapagos Islands and they vary subtly in terms of their body size and shape of the beak. Darwin returned to England with nine different species of these birds. According to contemporary Darwinian theory, differences in the sizes and shapes of the birds' beaks are the direct result of natural selection. One example often cited involves species of seed-eating finches. Following seasons of heavy rain, small soft seeds are plentiful throughout the islands. Birds with short beaks can easily gather food. However, during periods of drought, the only seeds available are encased in hard, tough shells that remain on the ground from the previous year. In these circumstances, only birds with longer, sharper beaks can crack the shells and eat the seeds. Those birds with the longer beaks survive because they can reach the food source, whereas other birds cannot. That long beak, then, confers what biologists now call a functional advantage. The finches with smaller beaks, unfortunately, die out from starvation because they cannot reach that food source. If the drought conditions continue, the environment causes a change in the features of the finch population as a whole. Over time, the long beaks are passed on to succeeding generations because those beaks enable the birds to survive. Natural selection was a powerful idea. Physical variations that proved advantageous would be inherited by succeeding generations. Through this process, populations would be altered and, over time, fundamentally different organisms would arise without any form of intelligent guidance. Darwin wanted to explain everything in the history of life in terms of undesigned, unintelligent natural processes. And when he looked for an explanation, what he found was that a process he could observe in domestic populations also operates in the wild. Now Darwin himself was very familiar with domestic breeding. He himself studied pigeon breeding. 
And he knew that for centuries, human breeders had been able to make dramatic changes in populations by selecting only certain individuals to breed. Darwin really suggested that this same process operates in the wild. For Charles Darwin, natural selection explained the appearance of design without a designer. There was no longer any need to invoke an intelligent cause for the complexity of life. In effect, natural selection became a kind of designer substitute. Today, Darwinism is generally assumed throughout science and the academic world. Yet, despite its wide acceptance, a growing number of scientists and scholars, including those who met at Pajaro Dunes, now challenge key aspects of Darwinian theory. When we came together at Pajaro Dunes, we certainly didn't agree on everything, but we did share a real dissatisfaction with the mechanism of natural selection and the role that it was playing in biological explanation. Natural selection is a real process, and it works well for explaining certain limited kinds of variation, small-scale change. We have lots of examples of that, in fact. Where it doesn't work well is explaining what Darwin thought it could, namely the real complexity of life. We have the finch beak, and then you've got the finch itself, a minor change in the structure of the beak versus the origin of the organism itself. These are different scales of phenomena. These are different kinds of problems. And the important problem for biology is to understand where natural selection works and where it doesn't and why there's a difference. Evidence is very powerful, and all of us had the sense that if we let that evidence speak for itself, that it would lead us in a very different direction, away from natural selection and towards a different conclusion about the origin and nature of life on Earth.